Do you feel stuck in a job or in a relationship that you're really not enjoying? Do you feel resentful about things that should or shouldn't be happening and powerless to do anything about it? Are you agonising about whether to stay and put up with the way things are or whether you need to leave, but you just can't make up your mind? You might need to approach things a bit differently. In this episode, I'm chatting with Karina Gordon-Barnes, a coach, trainer and specialist in how to make relationships easier. We're talking about how the real issue might be the assumptions and stories we're telling ourselves about what's really going on and how just putting up with things never really works. We chat about how to accept the things we can't control and how this might lead to less stress and more love. And we talk about how to take control over things that we can control so that we can either take action or have those conversations we really need to. This is a much more powerful place to be. So listen to this episode to find out the two different lists you need to make to start to make a good decision. Listen if you want to find out how to take control and stay in your zone of power and how to change your thoughts about the situation to become more compassionate, accepting and empowered. Welcome to You Are Not A Frog, the podcast for doctors and other busy professionals who want to beat burnout and work happier. I'm Dr. Rachel Morris. I'm a GP, now working as a coach, speaker and specialist in teaching resilience. Even before the coronavirus crisis, we were facing unprecedented levels of burnout. We have been described as frogs in a pan of slowly boiling water. We hardly noticed the extra long days becoming the norm and have got used to feeling stressed and exhausted. Let's face it, frogs generally only have two options. Stay in the pan and be boiled alive or jump out of the pan and leave. But you are not a frog and that's where this podcast comes in. It is possible to craft your work and life so that you can thrive even in difficult circumstances. And if you're happier at work, you'll simply do a better job. In this podcast, I'll be inviting you inside the minds of friends, colleagues and experts, all who have an interesting take on this, so that together we can take back control and love what we do again. I wanted to let you know that we're now taking bookings for our Shapes Toolkit programmes for late 2021 and 2022. Now, these programmes help doctors, professionals in health and social care and other high stress jobs take control of their workload, feel better and beat stress and burnout. We've got a whole range of options to choose from, from whole day programmes to webinars and workshops, both online and face to face. We've also got some brand new sessions on how to influence and negotiate, even if you're not the boss, dealing with conflict and how to support your team through the new ways of working without burning out yourself. We've also got bespoke sessions for those new to roles in general practice and for frontline staff on topics such as how to reduce drama on the frontline and how to respond to even the most outrageous rudeness. All our training is based on neuroscience and principles of coaching, productivity and wellness research to give people practical tools that they can use straight away. Find out more by emailing me or get in contact through our website. Now on with the episode. It's fantastic to have with me on the podcast today, in fact, back on the podcast, because I think, Karina, you you, you did one a while ago, Um, but we've got Karina Gordon-Barnes, and Karina is a coach and trainer, and she's got specific expertise in how to make relationships easier. So welcome, Karina. You're such a superpower, isn't it? (laughs) I can just make relationships easier wherever I go with this magic wand. Yeah, will you you come over to my house, please, and just sprinkle a little bit of magic? Yeah, anywhere. You know, anywhere with, with teenagers and two cats and, and everything, we could we could use it. Um, yeah. So first of all, it's brilliant to have you with us because I always find your wisdom and your insight really, really helpful. But secondly, how on earth did you get into this whole thing of making relationships easier? Because I'm thinking as a coach, you maybe could have picked an easier, <laughs> easier topic or an easier speciality. But what could be more fun? Um, I, do you know, I found that there was a theme running through all the work that I did as a coach. I've been coaching for 16 years and I was helping people with their careers actually to start with helping teenagers find what they wanted to do, help women find their passion, all these different areas, marketing. And, and actually at the, at the heart of all of it was connection. 
it was this belief that we all want to feel connected and so many things get in the way of connection and then what happened was as a certified coach I then found the work of Byron Katie which is another uh, approach that I layered on top of the coaching I already had and that was suddenly the how-to of how to clear anything that got in the way of connection because I think that's our default I think our default is connection and then on top of that we have all these thoughts beliefs assumptions that never get questioned but if we can question them and clear them we are just left with connection so that's what we want and so it's the most fulfilling work that I can imagine. Mm. Uh, It's interesting because the work I've been doing recently talking very much about the amygdala and how that puts us into the flight fight or freeze zone, how it is your threat detection system. I'm starting to read a lot about the fact that the amygdala is not just looking for threat. It's not just moving us away from threat, but it's actually seeking connection, seeking belonging. So it's this deep, deep rooted physiological, neurological response where we are moving away from people not liking us and seeking connection and deep connection so yeah. is this almost like this reflex that we've got yes and that desire for belonging can sometimes get in the way of authenticity so that desire to seek approval to be loved to belong to fit in can sometimes mean that we go against our own true nature so that would be i guess the flip side of of that desire for belonging so you're saying that because we want to belong, we then make ourselves into something that we're not in order for other people to accept us, or we don't have those conversations we should have, or we don't speak up or say if we disagree, things like that. Exactly that. You know, how many times has someone asked you, oh, would you like to do, I don't know, would you like to um, come to this party, let's say? And no part of you wants to go to the party. I mean, it's funny imagining parties in the middle of uh, you know, <laughs> um, the COVID times, but just nothing in you wants to go and yet you want to be part of the gang and belong and everything and so you say yes and you go along to the party and you spend the party feeling completely like you don't want to be there in your head you might even tell the story they made me come because that's like the way of kind of putting blame on them for us doing something that we didn't actually want to do um so yeah that's that's the that's the dark side of wanting to belong I guess another dark side would be sort of staying in relationships for too long that are that are toxic or not feeling that we could leave a job that 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 we really should know that we should be leaving because of the relationships that we've got and because of the belonging yes and what will you know what will happen to that that kind of feeling of community if I you know if you if you broke up with a a partner a marital spouse potentially losing the entire extended family you've got in-laws you've got parents-in-laws, sisters-in-laws, cousins, and all of that, there's such a strong um, urge to want to stay, to keep the status quo, to stay belonging to a community that you are already part of. Absolutely, a job, a team of colleagues, maybe a project that you're working on. It could be a, a house that you feel like you, you've been in a while, you belong with. It could be a, a city that you've built up lots of connections with. So often then we're not being very truthful about what is our current inclination and desire because of that 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 need to belong Mm. and that is it's a very tricky one then so how how do you help people when they've got these dilemmas when they've got difficult relationships when they're not quite sure what they should do because of their drive for belonging it is is so so strong Mm. Well, the very first thing is to be incredibly compassionate with anybody who feels caught in that should I stay or should I leave dilemma. Because it can just be exhausting. It can be a constant dialogue. Should I stay? Should I leave? Should I stay? Should I leave? That kind of limbo feeling of um, never really having quite um, both feet in somewhere. So you're not you're not wholeheartedly in something, but you're also you don't have the clarity and the decisiveness to leave so you're flip-flopping back and forward and so when when clients come to me whether it's you know normally a relationship um that's my position is um god this is hard you know it's so hard that you are in that should I stay or should I stay or should I leave place um so we start there uh and we really look at what often people do to try and get out of stay and leave there are two things people often try and do 
One thing is that they do a kind of pros and cons list. Uh, I remember when I, I actually had a, a place at Oxford University when I was 17, and I, I made my list of what like reasons to go and reasons to leave. And I remember I had this like long, you know, long list of reasons to, to go, and then this one reason not to go, but actually that one reason ended up winning for right or wrong reasons. But we kind of we make this pros or cons list. And we're kind of weighing up very logically and very almost mathematically how many things are on each side of the equation. And I, I would argue that that's not a great way of making a, um, making a decision. The other thing we do is we poll our friends. You know, we do a, a little kind of informal poll. You know, what, what do you think? Do you think I should stay? Should I leave? What about this? What about this? And then that's not great because you end up <clears throat> with lots of other people telling you what, what to do. And again, you're distanced from what you're what you call it, your heart, your soul, your spirit is saying is the right thing to do. So they're the two ways I wouldn't suggest <laughs> making a decision about whether to stay or leave. Yeah, and I can see, in fact, there's a decision I need to make the other day and I, I very nearly drew up a pros and cons list. And then I thought, hang on, there's no point because I know what the pros and cons are. I'm still just as stuck because yes. a lot of it is is on an emotional level as well. Um, yeah. And I know people talk about using your intuition too. I don't know where I stand on intuition because sometimes mine is completely wrong, actually. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, I think you make a really good point about that list. You know, you already know the pros and cons. They're already there. That's why you haven't made a decision yet, because you know there are reasons on either side. So just writing them down isn't necessarily going to really help that much. Mm -hmm. So the way that I do work, um, it's going to look a tiny bit like a pros and cons list to start with in that it's two lists, but they're completely different lists. OK, so the first list is all of the criticisms, judgments, complaints, with whatever the thing is that you're thinking about leaving. So if it was a person, it might be, he doesn't listen. She doesn't pull her weight. He's not on the same page as me. Um, she doesn't care about me. So you just make that list of all the things, all those kind of things which just come up, those thoughts which come up in your head and you take dictation from your mind and you write them down, all your problems. If it's a job, it might be things like, uh, my manager doesn't respect me. My colleagues are cliquey. Uh, there aren't enough opportunities for, for growth. It doesn't pay enough. Mm. Um, they don't, is, there's not flexible enough working conditions. So that is your list of all the reasons why it's really hard to stay wholeheartedly in whatever it is you're staying in. You then make another list of all of the reasons, all of the fears about leaving. So if I leave then, so let's say it's a, a person, if I leave, um, the family will be decimated, devastated, broken forever. If I leave, um, people will judge me. If I leave, I'll never find someone else. If you haven't yet had kids and you want to, if I leave this one, I'll never find someone that I can have children with. You know, I'll, I'll have left it too late. So really valid fears you put down on another list. If it's a job, maybe it's the fear, um, my CV will look choppy. Um, uh, what else might you have with a job? It'll be just as bad somewhere else. <laughs> just as bad somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's a particular, maybe there's a job you've got in mind and you're, you're already seeing, oh, but, you know, if I leave, then these problems are going to be in that new job. So when you've got these two lists, again, just that compassion with no wonder I'm stuck. No wonder I'm in limbo because there are all these reasons why I can't stay with my full heart. But there are all these fears, which mean I can't just leave. It's terrifying. Mm. Wow. But that must be pretty overwhelming. Right. <laughs> I'm just thinking, oh, my word. <laughs> But it's it's good to get it out there. In fact, I was coaching right. someone yesterday about about something, and he had all the list of stuff. He had it. He had the list, but it wasn't until we found the reasons behind the thinking and what was actually the problem and really going on, and then it's like, ah, okay, that's the yes, that is that is the thing. And, and I presume a lot of these things, one or two of them, will be the thing, and the others probably don't matter as much. 
Well, the thing to do is once you've then got those lists is to go, these are all thoughts. So everything I'm looking at now on my lists, this is not reality. Although some of these things may well be very, very true. I'm not looking at reality. I am looking at two lists of thoughts. Thoughts that wake me up at night, th thoughts that I, you know, stop me from going to sleep, thoughts that are just rumbling around my head when I'm out for a walk. But these are thoughts and thoughts can be questioned. Mm -hmm. So that's then the next phase is you take just one of those thoughts. So let's say my manager doesn't respect me. And you say, OK, is this true? You are interrogating to see, is that just a kind of an opinion? Is it just one possibility or is it a rock solid fact? Mm -hmm. Because often we are trying to make these decisions based on unquestioned assumptions, thoughts that are not facts. I think this is a really interesting and important point. And I think people really struggle with this sometimes that it is your thinking that's causing the stress rather than the, the actual situation. Correct. And so it's like you said, some of these things may be true, but all of the thing that's causing us to stress is purely our thoughts thinking around what's going on is is, is that is that correct it's correct which I find incredibly good news <laughs> <laughs> because your thoughts aren't they are just thoughts they are interpretations their assumptions their beliefs and so many times they haven't been questioned so when I'm lying there at three in the morning and you know my thoughts are going around they're not actually being questioned as I lie there I'm not going you know is that true that my manager doesn't respect me let me really look at the evidence. Let me look at that time when she walked into the, the room and she said, what's this? I just assume that that means she doesn't respect me. But let me just, let me just sit a little bit longer with, is that actually exactly what was going on? Could there have been something happening in her world that day? Could it be that that's just her communication style, but actually she really does respect me? You know, I think we've all had those occasions when someone has you know, looked like looked critical, like I've been giving a talk and someone's been sat there like this, like, I thought, oh gosh, oh gosh, I think I'm talking absolute rubbish. What's, oh no, I better stop talking. And afterwards, they're the first person in line to say, that was amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh, everything. Yeah. And that's just their fate. That's their concentration phase. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. I've had that on Zoom, you know, that person was just looking away constantly thinking, oh no, that person's so disengaged or whatever. And then actually they were making notes on another computer and, you know, it looked yeah, like they were just answering their emails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there are assumptions that we make and I get that. I think... Mm -hmm. uh, probably many of our listeners are thinking yeah but there are things that are actually going on like say Absolutely. um the the workload is horrendous or say something has happened like I have got a complaint that has happened you yes. can't say is that true or not yes. so what is it about why is it my thinking that's causing problems rather than the actual thing that's causing the problem right well let, let's so let's get specific can we give an example where someone's like that's absolutely just true blanket true yeah so uh let's say I have so much administration to do on a on a in a surgery that I have to stay for two or three hours afterwards and I get home two hours late every time because yes. there is too much work to do yes well that it sounds like there's a there's a fact in there you know if there is a fact that there is no physical way of doing the work required of that job description then we've we've got a fact and and, and so the thought in there that I think is the one to be questioned is there's nothing I can do about this. Okay. So if we question that and we see, well, actually, you know, is there something I can do about this? Often, is there a conversation that I can have? It might be quite a brave conversation. It might be quite a vulnerable conversation. And there are two places which we might not want to go. So it's actually easier to go with, oh, this is just the way it is. And it's, too, it's impossible and I can't do it rather than. Do I need to have a very vulnerable or brave conversation with either my partner about me coming home two hours late or with the people I work with or, or someone somewhere? What is my power? What can I do to if, if the facts are that it's not going to be the facts that are actually causing the problem? It's that like I can't do anything about it or something like that. 
Yeah, so it's not the thing that's causing the stress because like having two hours extra work, that doesn't cause stress. But thinking it's not fair, right? I'm not going to be able to do it, right? it's always going to happen, yes. I'm stuck there. It's those thoughts that are causing you the stress, not the actual fact of the thing. Exactly. And those thoughts actually possibly are adding to the work. So those thoughts are possibly, you know, if you're having those thoughts, you're not going to have your full focus on the work because it might take longer. Um, you might just not be as clear minded because that's all running in the background. So you just you, you can't go, oh, hang on, there's this there's a shortcut I could take or, oh, there's this person that I could delegate to or, oh, maybe there's a different way of doing this that takes a shorter time. Those might be possible once your mind is is clearer of those thoughts. Mm. OK, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to clear up that thing about yeah. it's our thinking that causes the stress, not the actual thing, because this is where people often get stuck in, yeah. in the training that we do, isn't it? When we talk yeah. about, look, yeah. it's stories in your head. Yeah. It's not the actual thing. Is that lovely quote from Eleanor Roosevelt? No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So you very much come from the place of you write down your these two lists are your yes. thoughts about what's going on. And then you yes. can start questioning them. Yes. And just, and just to go back. So just to go back a tiny bit. This is very much not about denying reality. Yeah. You know, if your work takes two hours and that is a like so, rock solid fact. Then isn't it more powerful to say that is the fact rather than it shouldn't be this way? You know, if we're saying it shouldn't be this way, actually, for me, that is the denying of reality. Because the reality is there is two hours of work and it's just such a more peaceful like you can just feel within you that, that the difference between oh there's two hours of work and it shouldn't be this way and why is it always down to me and this isn't the way it should be and then versus okay there's two hours of work what do I want to do about that mm. yeah and this is the difference I think between being in in your zone of power which is in that circle about what you can control yeah and outside of your your zone of power Yes. And what is in your zone of power, often it is um, about being vulnerable, um, about being authentic, about being brave. What is in your zone of power often takes courage. That's the word that I like to think of when I'm thinking about, okay, in my zone of power, I'm, I've probably been avoiding something that's in my control, in my zone of power, because it takes a whole load of courage. Hmm. And it's so much easier to blame others, the situation, the system, life, than actually stepping into, oh, this is going to involve an uncomfortable decision or an uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. And that's not denying that the, the blame is on life or the system or the organization, but actually you can't do anything to change that, you know, right. unless literally you are the, the head honcho. But, you know, everyone has a boss and a boss and a boss and a boss. So there's limited amount that you can do to change the wider system so the only thing you really are in control of is is what you do yeah your own actions yeah. yeah and and that's what you know questioning these assumptions let's say it's a romantic relationship you know he he should pull his weight more it's a very common one <laughs> um, not to be too gendered but that does tend to be that direction you know he should pull his weight more okay well what is the reality and then what can I do about it what is the conversation that I need to have what is the responsibility that I need to relinquish? And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And then we deal with the consequences of that um, rather than, well, he should pull his weight more. Doesn't, it's, it's ineffective. It doesn't do anything. Mm. So if we, let's, let's go back then. So you were saying the first thing you did is question the thought. Is it, is it true or not? Yeah, so we go right back. So first of all, mm. compa compassion for being yeah. in the should I stay or should I leave predicament because it, yeah. it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Number two is the list of, all the reasons, all the, all the complaints yeah. and all the fears. Mm -hmm. So complaints that make it hard to stay, fears that make it hard to leave. And then you question things on either side. So you, you question, you, you sit with, literally you sit with, you know, is it true that he doesn't pull his weight? And you interrogate it as if you have no agenda. You are just looking for the sake of truth. Now, is that, you know, is that true that he does not pull his weight? You'll notice that your mind brings images, brings scenes of the kitchen, the, you know, the bins, the laundry room, wherever, wherever your mind pulls images for. You're going to find loads of loads of images that say, yes, 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 he doesn't pull his weight. OK, you say, OK, 
is it true? Is it true? Can I find any evidence that it might not be completely the whole truth? Okay, I suddenly see him doing this, you know, he drove here and I suddenly see he cooked this meal and I suddenly see that he um, fixed this. And, and it just starts to break the, um, the, the kind of blinkeredness of this is the way it is and that's all that there is. And it becomes a little maybe grayer. In a, in a good way, you know, a little less black and white. And you start to just notice that softening, like, okay, there's, there's more going on here than I at first thought. And then maybe you look at one of those fears, like, um, <clears throat> like if I leave, um, you know, my children will, will be dysfunctional forever because they're gonna come from a broken, a broken home. Okay, first of all, you see all those images. Yes, you see maybe your own childhood or your parents divorced, or you see, <clears throat> friends you know or situations people you know who haven't been able to form great relationships because of their part all of these again come flooding out because you're always going to have your confirmation bias first you're always going to have the default assumption come first and then can I absolutely know that that's true that this is gonna you know f my kids up is that can I absolutely know Maybe you suddenly find images of other people you know where actually the kids thrived when the parents split up and were more harmonious with each other or where those children developed a sense of um, having stronger standards in relationships or, you know, so, so suddenly again, it becomes just a bit grayer and a bit more multi-dimensional. So then you're sat here with the gray, more the gray on this side and more the gray on this side. And then what happens is you start noticing you moving in a certain direction. Because these unquestioned assumptions aren't there on either side, just kind of banging against either side, everything's kind of softened and gone grayer. And then you just notice, oh, I, without that thought that he doesn't pull his weight, I notice, I'm noticing more that he does. I'm noticing a real um, gratitude actually, for the things he does that I don't do. Um, gosh, I'm noticing this, I'm noticing, oh, I actually, I went, I went to give him a, a hug or a kiss and I hadn't felt like doing that for a while. So you start to notice that, that kind of, just notice without the thoughts there, there's a, a draw there. And then similarly on the other side, oh, without the thought that my, my kids are gonna be decimated by this, I notice that actually I am moving away from him, that I'm not, I'm not as committed as I, I, I thought I was and, and I'm, I'm just kind of being honest and noticing that I'm going in a different direction. And so, and so both of those movements are so much more natural and fluid and, and authentic because you don't have unquestioned stories holding you in place. Mm -hmm. So questioning the stories in our heads always really, really helpful. <clears throat> and it's then what you do what you do with that in order to make mm -hmm. these decisions? Yeah. Well, then often you see there isn't a decision that gets made like from your head in that way. Mm. Like how I was describing, you just notice, like, let's say it's a, a job we're talking about. You might just notice, oh, I notice that I'm Googling or going on whatever website, you know, to look for other jobs. I just noticed that. Or, oh, I notice actually I'm having these different kind of conversations with my manager and I notice that I feel more connected. To, to her and so it's kind of not really then a decision it's more a noticing what is actually then happening and it's that that trust of that direction that you're going in because you're not being controlled by those stories anymore mm -hmm. I think when we talked about this before Karina I said to you you know these people that come to you with like should I stay should I go through a relationship you know what tends to be the outcome you know how many people stay how many people go and you say actually the majority of people end up staying they do they do what's behind right. that well because I think when we get together with someone if we're talking about a romantic relationship um and we fall in love and we you know we often that kind of honey the traditional honeymoon period is because those thoughts haven't started to arise yet Yes. right so we just see how compatible we are and how much we love them and that magic and that feeling and all that connection and it, it all just feels amazing and and then something happens they don't put the dish in the dishwasher or they um you know stop being interested in having sex with us or they start being a bit kind of hazy with money or whatever our issue is right we will you'll have the thing which comes up 
that starts happening and and like I say that that gets in the way that blocks us from feeling that inherent love and connection with that person so even in the situations where the person does leave if they've done this work they are leaving with love they are leaving with that initial love and connection that was there they've maybe seen that okay we're not actually compatible as a partnership anymore but they're not leaving um, out of anger or um, resentment. They're leaving out of, I love you. And I noticed that I'm leaving because this is no longer the place for me to feel most myself or most, you know, to be connected with my vision of what life is to be or whatever it is. But in either way, you actually leave with love. You, you either stay or leave with love for your partner. Because mm -hmm. that's, okay. you, that's where you were to start with. Yeah, and how much better is it to, to to leave like that than to leave in a horribly acrimonious sort of way? Yeah. And I guess that's so true for jobs as well. We always want to Absolutely. leave well and not burn our bridges and and do it respectfully and and all of that. Yes. And I know that when we talked before, you were saying that actually, and I said to you, well, how does that work that people have decided to stay? And I guess it would, it was something around being able to put up with things much more because yeah, because you're actually loosened your well they should be like that or they should right. do this right. is that is, is that the way that, that that you see that people manage to stay I wouldn't use the words put up with <laughs> <laughs> I would say accept <clears throat> accept okay because again back to the zone of power in our zone of power the things that we need to do are things which revolve courage the mm -hmm. things which are other people's involve acceptance. So it's that, it, I like to use the example of someone's funeral, where, you know, when you go to someone's funeral, let's say my granny's funeral, right? And she was a, you know, as, as all are, not actually weirdly, not, not the granny I was talking about in the last podcast, <laughs> who then did, did die after the last, last podcast very soon. My other granny who died earlier. At her funeral, people were honest, you know? She... <laughs> She was a little bit racist. She was a little bit, you know, she didn't listen very well. She wasn't very interested in, you know, all the things that were true about her, we said with love, because we accepted like, oh yeah, granny, you know, hadn't quite, you know, got her head around same sex relationships or what, you know, I, she actually did, but, but whatever it was, so, somehow when someone dies, you actually accept the things that made them them, their quirks, their faults, the fact that they always left their nails, they clipped their nails and left them on the side. People actually laugh and feel really affectionate and kind of, oh, remember her nails. <laughs> Whereas when they're alive, you're like, oh my gosh, the nails. <laughs> so I, I kind of see it like that. Like we accept people like we would if they were, if they were dead, you know. Um, we accept. So what was your original question? <laughs> about, it's about putting up with things or versus with, right. accepting them. Yeah. Right. So, you know. Putting up with, let's say someone, you know, I don't know, clips their toenails and leaves them on the sofa. Okay. <laughs> the resentment <laughs> way looks at them and goes, oh, that's disgusting. You're so disgusting. I can't believe I'm with such a disgusting party that you would leave your toenails on the side of the sofa. Acceptance looks like, oh, look. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> oh, toenails on the sofa. Wouldn't I miss them if they were dead? You know, there they are. Um, isn't that, you know, isn't that lovely that, they were obviously so busy or so, you know, caught up in their thoughts that they didn't think. Now, doesn't mean that we can't, in our zone of power, say, it really doesn't work for me that you leave your toenails on the sofa. Could you please um, <laughs> and then put them in the bin? But there's, there's an acceptance. There's, there's actually kind of an affectionate, loving acceptance of this is who this person is. This is all that is true about this person that is completely outside of my power. And I, I noticed that I'm still staying. I noticed that even with all these aspects, I noticed that I'm still staying. There's something about that love that's keeping me, keeping me here. Mm. And, and just, acceptance is that putting up with is a kind of victim position where yeah. you're kind of tolerating and, oh, poor me, aren't I amazing that I'm putting up with? And accepting is a very powerful position of love and clear-sightedness. Yeah, so putting up with it would be, oh god he's left his toenails on the sofa again that's just really yeah. irritating me but I'm not going to say anything yeah, for the sake right. of harmony yes. <laughs> yes exactly all this harmony that I'm feeling on the inside yeah. <laughs> <laughs> except because oh look there goes that pile again and then I have a choice don't I, I have a choice whether to say darling that's yes. disgusting yes or just sweep them up myself 
beating up myself, it's, it's move the me. bin nearer, put a little toenail dish on the sofa, you know, what, all the things that are in our power. We have so mm. much power when we actually see reality as it is, not constantly kind of behind this veil of, well, it shouldn't be like this. They shouldn't be like this. They shouldn't be like this. Mm. I think it's that should word. Yeah. That is just, just gets you. I, I remember because I've yeah. done some sessions of the, the, the work with you, Karina, and I was yeah. sat in a, this was before COVID, sat in a cafe doing some work. It was really lovely. And, and a yeah. woman came in with a baby that was screaming. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was screaming its head <laughs> off and it started to, I get quite affected by noise. It just started to yes. really irritate. And this baby was obviously very distressed yeah. you know and mm -hmm. obviously in a complete lack of empathy you know not <laughs> thinking back to my three kids when I would have been you know knackered and tired and just thinking I just need a coffee yes. I was thinking this she should take it out and it's really disturbing everybody else and she should yes. and I just thought hang on a sec John, mm. it's your thinking like that that's causing you irritation mm. and should she well no of course she shouldn't you know the reality yeah. is the baby's here she's a young mum obviously looks knackered <laughs> It's my thinking about that. And I just say, I can choose to just ignore those, ignore those. She should just put my headphones on. And yeah. once I sort of, it was still irritating me a bit, but it was much less yes. than I was thinking, oh, come on. She should, she should, yes. she should. Because she should requires absolutely no action from us. Right? Mm. We, we just get to stay there complaining and being the victim. Um, so in that situation, for example, I could move. I have that power. Sometimes we completely forget we have that power. Yeah, yeah. Or I could ask her to move. I can do that. Again, that's the courageous bit, right? To go up to someone and say, oh, what's, you know, lovely baby. <laughs> I appreciate you. It's may really want flipping loud, um, yes. <laughs> I'm actually having a really important business meeting here. Would it work for you to move? Um, so I actually did this. I sat, um, not with a, a crime baby, but a man who was lighting up a cigarette. I was sitting on a, a bench and I was about to eat my lunch. Uh, in, a in a Cambridge College, you know, garden, uh, museum, Fitzwilliam, I think, museum, sitting outside on the bench, and a guy came, sat down next to me, and started rolling a cigarette. And I just noticed that it wasn't going to work for me while I ate my lunch. Um, so I said to him, you know, are you going to smoke that now? Because if you if you are, I'll move. So I really took responsibility for that. And he went, oh no no, okay, no no problem, I'll move. And he went and sat on the grass. It's like it hadn't occurred to him that it would bother me. And I was fully prepared that I would have, if he'd said, yes, I'm going to smoke it and just sat there looking at me, I'd have said, great, I'm, I'm going to move now. And so it's just so, it's so empowering to realise that you have choices, that you don't just have to sit there. Yeah, you always have a choice. Now, this is something that people really struggle with, Karina. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, in all the training, it's like, actually, you have a choice. Um, people say, I have no choice about when I leave work, no choice whatsoever. Okay, well, you do have a choice. You know, you at yes. any point, like you could halfway through your work, you could stand up and leave. I mean, yes. the consequences yes. are you yes. might get the sack. Yes. But you are in charge of when you leave. And people really, yeah, but I don't, that's a choice because if I get the sack, I can't provide for my family and blah. I said, well, yes. you, the choice. choices have consequences that you yes. might not like, yes. but you always have a choice. And that is that is quite difficult because to get ahead yeah. around, like, because that choice of you speaking to that person on the bench is yes. some, something that people, well, I don't like that choice of having to say something. Mm. I don't like it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Get it. <laughs> isn't there so much, isn't there so much in life that we just don't like? And the thing is, is that we can stay in that position and we can stomp our feet and we can r rant and rave, you know, I'll, let's just kind of, <laughs> go to a, a quite big um, example of this when my son died when Alfie died during you know during labor I didn't like it that was not my choice you know I can and and the thing is is that I can scream and I can shout and I can cry and I can wave my fist at life and say f you how dare you or I can point absolutely to something else that made me a victim and say I don't like this and I this shouldn't have happened and I don't want it to happen and I what does it do? What does it do? It doesn't bring the person back. It doesn't change the sit. I can sit there. The man with a cigarette isn't going to move. The woman with a baby isn't going to move. None of that's going to happen. So we have to ask ourselves, is this a mature, powerful, um, effective position? Right? Anytime we are in that, this shouldn't be happening. I don't like it position. Is it mature? Is it powerful? Is it effective? 
and and I haven't found that it is so so yes to just acknowledge that of course you don't like it and if you want to be peaceful if you want to feel powerful then then you have to take another option and I really like the question that you often ask about this which is where would you be without this thought Mm. so where would I be without that (laughs) thought that okay trivial I don't like that man's you know that man shouldn't be smoking or that baby shouldn't be crying yes um yes where would I be that thought that I shouldn't have to wait this this long it's not fair it, it, yes. and it's quite right it might be true that it's not fair absolutely but the reality is it's happening right yes yeah I mean there's so much that's not fair I mean we can look at you know gosh anything you know the racism that's currently being poured out onto our England team like that shouldn't be happening right but what's the point of me sitting here saying it shouldn't be happening it is happening what can we do about it what laws can we put in place? What education can happen? Um, so just notice that, that any time we say it shouldn't be happening, we're not being powerful. We're not being impactful. We're not having any kind of effect on life. We're just being at the effect of life. Again, completely reasonably. You know, it's not, it's not unreasonable to think these, these things shouldn't be happening, but the reality is they are. Mm. And I guess it is okay to feel... The emotions around that, isn't it? Like, so when when Alfie died, obviously so much sadness. Yes. And actually more authentic sadness was enabled, like real pure, beautiful grief was enabled because I didn't keep the story. This shouldn't have happened. This shouldn't have happened would have kept me in a kind of, kind of pretend grief where I'm kind of, this shouldn't have happened. Whereas, okay, well, it has happened. How do I want to be with that? allowed me just to to cry and to love and to feel and to connect and to do things um whether it's you know like educating around bereavement care from in maternity or you know sharing his story with others that in, it enabled me to be powerful because i was facing reality as it actually was not as i thought i wanted it to be mm-hmm. and so i think it's interesting when, when you say that people sort of end up quite a lot of the time staying with their partners or staying in the job or staying with that friendship. Because I'm presumably it's not all about should I leave a partner? Sometimes it's no. like a toxic yeah. family relationship or even a colleague or a work or a friend or something like that. It's they are able to stay because when their friend or their partner or their work does something that previously would have eaten them away at their core yes now they're just saying oh look at that (laughs) yes absolutely like oh isn't that interesting that that's happened and again like you know is this something that I want to do something about again is there a conversation or an action that is courageous that I need to take um or is this just about me going you know not my business not my zone of power not my lane whatever you want to call it that's just them being them doing their thing and So what I see when people stay after doing this kind of work is that they stay with more love, acceptance, a kind of recommitment. It's a kind of, you know, renewing your marriage vows or um, recommitting. So sometimes, for example, people have worked with me who aren't yet married and haven't had children. And soon after our sessions, they do get married to the person that they weren't sure if they were going to leave. And then they do go on and have children if that's what they choose to do. And it's, the, the key is, is that it's with choice. It's with power. It's like not just, oh, well, we might as well get married because we've been together a couple of years and that's probably what we should do because we're in our mid-30s. And it's like, oh, I've actually re... I've seen this person through new eyes. I'm experiencing them completely afresh. I'm remembering not just what brought me to them in the first place, but all these things and ways in which they've changed that I thought were negative, but actually I'm seeing the benefit of and oh my gosh, I want to marry them. And oh my gosh, I want to have, you know, build a family or build whatever other, other projects with this person. So it's it's like, it's really not just kind of staying two feet in, but like jumping two feet in. Mm-hmm. So that's that, rather than trying to change that person, you suddenly start accepting who they are, quirks, foibles and all. Yes. And it's about changing the story that we're telling ourselves in our heads yes. and staying in our zone of power about where we have got the choice about about what we do absolutely Mm. and and sometimes that that makes you slightly more 
what was the word? Or less affable, perhaps. Oh, no, maybe <laughs> affable is the wrong word, but um, it's, you know, okay, you, darling, you're choosing to watch the, the cricket all day today. That's, mm-hmm. that's great. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go and do something else rather than stay yes. there in the sitting room with the, or actually for me, it's football. I can't, this is yeah. dreadful. I shouldn't say this. I cannot stand <laughs> football. <laughs> My family just berate me about this. Apparently it's the worst thing in the world, but, you know, I'll admit it here because it's just to like, I don't know, a few thousand people. That's all right, isn't it? Fine. And I cannot stand being in a room when there's a match on and yeah. people are like, well, mum, you should join in and watch it. I'm like, I don't want to. I'm really yeah. pleased that you want to watch it. That's yeah. great. But I'm just going to go and do something that brings me joy. And that's going to be much yes. better for the family. So you have to be quite strong sometimes. Yes. How liberating. I mean, so here are your two options, right? You, you could stay in the room and sit there going, well, oh, I hate football, but they told me I should be here. So I'm going to sit here. And, and, and accidentally I, cheer for the wrong side. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which doesn't really go down very well. You know, maybe you're there and you're on your phone. You're not really there, right? You're there. You're kind of, I'm in the room with you because you told me I had to be. I'm on my phone. And, and it just feels... It feels victimy, disempowering, all yeah. of those kind of things. Or you go, brilliant, they're all occupied. I'm heading to get my nails done or whatever it is you want to do. Going for a run, going to the gym, going to do yoga, yeah. anything. Um, and, you can, and you can't tell the story, they made me watch football. Mm. Yeah. And that story, they made me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's red flag alert. Red flag alert. Yeah. <laughs> They made me, they should. Yes. Um, or I, I ought. Yeah. Is that yeah. another one that people... Yeah, absolutely. Because at the end of that is some kind of fear, right? I ought to because otherwise, and then how would you finish that sentence? You know, because otherwise they'll think I'm a killjoy. Otherwise there's some kind of fear. You know, I ought to join that, um, let's say back to a job. You know, I ought to join that after work zoom drinks thing even though i have no desire to whatsoever sit on zoom another half an hour with a glass of wine like no that's not what i want to do at all um i ought to the fear is because otherwise you know they'll they'll think i'm kind of a party pooper or they'll 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 have conversations that are important that i'll miss out on or and again you just look at those fears and you question them is that true is that what's going to happen can i know that is there some way that I could mitigate that? Could I say, I'm not going to join the, the after work drinks, um, but if anything important comes up work-wise, please let me know. Mm. Right? That's total zone of power. Yeah. And, and, and again, truthful, truthful to the self. I'm only going to do what is truthful for me that I am wholehearted about and that is, it is authentic and in my integrity. Mm. Well, I think when people are thinking, particularly about jobs as as well you know they think there's all this pressure they made me but actually when you dig deeper into it rather than it's they made me it's it's an I ought yes I ought and actually a lot of the pressure we're putting on on ourselves is from ourselves and our thinking rather than rather than from somebody else yes it's interesting sometimes we have the story like well you know I have to stay till x time because otherwise and then you can look at a colleague who's not doing that and feel really resentful how are they getting away with it it's because they're not running the story that they ought to and you can actually use that as an example of actually, look, that consequence that I thought would happen to me if I left on time, that hasn't happened to my colleague, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was talking to someone who was saying, you know, so frustrated, duty dot skate day, gets everything done. Then just as leaving, walks out into the pharmacy, there's 10 prescriptions on the clip. Mm. Then they have to go and like, my, mm-hmm. uh, well, mm-hmm. I feel I ought to mm. so that when the next person comes in the next day I ought to it's like well yes it's you know and then just them realizing that actually someone else leaves theirs and if you finish you finish then it's totally fine because then you you change the system don't you if you stop doing it it's like the system then has to change um again a different conversation a different dynamic has to be put in place if you I often use the example of changing your dance moves you know, if you're always in a dance with someone, let's say with your partner, you always do this and they do that. And then you do that. So, you know, he, he looks a bit grumpy about something. You say, oh, what's wrong? And then he says, oh, why do you always? And then you do. It's like <laughs> a certain dynamic happens. Let's say instead, and I've done this with so many clients and they've come back and been like, it's completely different. <laughs> They'll say so he's, he's been grumpy, let's say. And you just don't do your normal thing and you, you know, happily go on and go and sit down and read a book or whatever it is he suddenly lost his dance partner he's like hang on a second (laughs) and then what you'll notice 
invariably is that then he changes because there isn't that it's just that dance has gone so if you leave your prescriptions on the wherever something about the system the game the dance has to change mm. Mm. yes and, and you you've also got a choice haven't you you can either go back you know leave it and feel really really guilty about yeah. it or you yeah. can leave it next day drop a line saying I, yes. I had finished you know I left them is that okay is there anything we could change about the way the system goes maybe yes. we can have an agreement that after 4 p.m the juice source doesn't have you know exactly yes. so you then okay. you then take the control and the power and, and think about things that you can do and often it's just little things actually isn't it it is actually again it's it's potentially a courageous conversation or courageous action mm -hmm. that's always a question that I would ask it's like if I'm if I've been doing that kind of shoulds, I ought to, they should, if they made me, all of that, a, a different way of thinking is what is in my power? What is a courageous conversation or action that I could have, that I could do that might just shift something here? Mm -hmm. So small things, small things, small changes that are gonna that are gonna help. So Karina, we're really nearly out of time. If you were to give us the top three tips for well, deciding, you know, if you're in a, a difficult relationship, a difficult job, a difficult friendship, any sort of thing, what, what would you be your three top tips for dealing with that or beginning yeah. to start to deal with it? It's number one, compassion. Just be so yeah. compassionate with yourself that you are in that position. It's a natural, normal, healthy human place to be. Nothing wrong with you for that being in that place. And, it, and it's hard. So just being compassionate, like, wow, I'm in a really hard place in, with this limbo. Number two, you list out your, uh, your complaints and your fears. You recognize that they are their thoughts, so they can be questioned. And then number three is that you question them. And, mm -hmm. and when you question them, then you're left with that. Noticing, what are you doing? Noticing, are you being drawn in one direction or another when that, those kind of black and whites are grayer? Mm -hmm. And then I guess, yeah, I would just add to that. And then once you start to question your thoughts, it's about what, what can I do then? What, what is yes. in my power? Yes. What do I need to have courage to do? And what can I accept? Yes. And yes. like you were saying, it may be that just making those changes, a bit of acceptance and a bit of courage, yeah. that's enough to, to change the whole situation, to change yes. the whole dynamics. So that either you, again, it's not having a kind of um, a bias for either leaving or staying it's that if you stay you stay in that recommitted place and if you leave you can leave with love and um kind of peace towards that person mm -hmm. or, or the job or whatever it is you're leaving thank you gosh that, that's just been incredibly helpful i think there's a lot of people here listening taking notes going okay right that's i need to ask that question is that really true what can i do um what we'll do is we'll make a, a zone of power download available for people to to download which is just a handout that talks a bit a little bit more about the zone of power so they can have a look at that and karina if people wanted to contact you how could they how could they find out more about you and about your work yep so karina gordon barnes.com that i will spell that because my name it's the Bob Dylan spelling way. So Karina, C-O-R-R-I-N-A, and then Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-M, B-A-R-N-E-S dot com. And you could also connect with me on Instagram. I'm Karina GB or Twitter. I'm Karina GB. Brilliant. Thank you. So we'll put all of those links in the show notes as well. And, and LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn. Brilliant. Uh, will you come back another time? Because I think there's, there's so much more that we can explore about this. Absolutely. would love to. <laughs> Thanks so much, Karina. See you soon. See you. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends and colleagues. Please subscribe to my You Are Not A Frog email list and subscribe to the podcast. And if you have enjoyed it, then please leave me a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. So keep well, everyone. You're doing a great job. You got this. <laughs>